Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Ricefield United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at the Vine, the online campus of Ricefield United Methodist Church. We are truly grateful to have this opportunity to worship together. No matter where you are joining us from, we cherish your presence today with us. We believe God will encounter you through today's worship service. So now let us prepare our heart before God. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here. It's my great joy today to lead us in our opening congregational prayer. Please join me now as we pray together. The words will be found on your screen. Holy and loving God, in this hour of worship, open our ears to hear you, our lips to praise you, our minds to understand you, our hearts to love you, and when we leave, our hands to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able, either in body or in spirit, as we join together in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus fairly stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. I will rise and go to Jesus, he will take me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, there are ten thousand charms. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome, God's free bounty glorified. True belief and true repentance, every grace that brings you nigh. I will arise and go to Jesus, he will take me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, there are ten thousand charms. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you wait until you're better, you will never come back at all. And go to Jesus, he will take me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, hold oh, it are ten thousand charms. It is my great privilege to get to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, we come before you with humble heart seeking your presence and your guidance. We give thanks for your endless love and grace that renew us each day. Lord, we ask for your wisdom and discernment in our lives and in our community. Help us to understand the depth of your love and to extend that love to others. Teach us to be patient, kind, and compassionate even when we face differences. 
remind us that we are one body in Christ, called to live in unity and peace. We pray for our leaders and for all who hold positions of authority in our community and our country. Grant them wisdom and integrity as they serve. May they seek to promote justice, peace, and the common good. And may we, as your people, be supportive and prayerful, seeking shalom of all. Lord, we lift up our burdens and our concerns to you. Especially now, we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those who are suffering, bring your healing and comfort. For those who are lost, shine your light upon their path. For those who are weary, grant them rest and renewal. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to worship our God. Hey, I'm Doug Lane, Senior Pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and we're about to make our weekly um, request for you to uh, give your offering to the church. And of course, you can do that um, by multiple ways. The easiest probably is to simply go on our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, and you'll see a, a Donate Now link there on the webpage, and you can make a, a a gift to the church, but I just want to give you kind of an update of where we are. Um, we've just passed the six month period in our church and um, we've done some amazing things this year, uh, but we found ourselves to be about $22,000 um, behind our, um, our spending so far. Um, now we have a $1.8 million budget, so $22,000 does not sound that uh, much, but uh, we reach about 1,000 people each and every week, either through in-person worship or through uh, this video. And so um, I was wondering um, if you might feel led to help with that um, $22,000 deficit. If each of the 1,000 people that watches uh, worship this week were to give an extra $22, then we would make up that difference uh, in one week. So if you're usually the kind of person that uh, doesn't give any money, I'd I uh, invite you to consider giving $22. If you're somebody who gives $20 this week, I invite you to give $42. If you tend to give $100, I invite you to give $122. Just one week, if you would consider giving an extra $22 in order to help continue the ministries here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for your time. Pastor Julia, and today I have something really cool to tell you about. One thing that it means to be a Christian, one way that we show that we're part of the church, is we help each other. That means that if there's someone who we see who has a need and we can help, we always try to. One way that we do that here at Wrightsville is with something called the Grace Place. The Grace Place is technically just a part of our church that's underneath a staircase, but we use it to try to help people in our community. Did you know that there's people right here in Wilmington who don't have enough food to eat? We think that they should have enough food to eat. And so when we're out at the grocery store, sometimes we can go and get extra food and we put it on these shelves and it goes to a place called Mother Hubbard's Cupboard and they give food to people who are hungry. 
Or did you know that there's some kids who have to go to school not feeling very clean because maybe they don't have a toothbrush at home or they don't have enough soap or sometimes they don't have deodorant and they need it? It's really hard to learn when you feel stinky. So we collect personal products for kids who need them and we make sure that we have school supplies too so that they have the other tools that they need to learn. What you can do is anytime that you are out at the grocery store or shopping with your parents, you can check our list to see what we need most right now. And you can pick up a couple of those things while you're out shopping. You know, I think it would be really fun to do that right now. Do you wanna come with me? Let's go. Okay, first we're gonna get some deodorant. And let's see, I think I'm gonna get this kind because it doesn't have a lot of smell, so I think anyone would like it. Okay, on to the next thing. Okay, next up is juice. Now, let's see, I remember that the list said that we didn't want anything glass. So I'm gonna get some of this apple juice that comes in a plastic bottle. I think I'll get two bottles today. I think we're all set. That was easy. Okay, I'm back from the store and I have the things that we need. So now we just have to figure out where on the shelves they go. Okay, first we have our sticks of deodorant. So let's see, I'm gonna find, here's a basket and it has a label that says personal products. So that's where that's gonna go. And then for our juice, Mother Hubbard's food goes over here. So I'm gonna take our bottles of juice and put them here. You know, that was so easy, but I feel so good now because I know that I did something that's gonna make a difference for someone who needs something. I hope that you take this chance too to remember people who don't have as much as we do and try to meet their needs because that's part of what it means to be the church. Will you say a prayer with me? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for making me part of the church. Please help me to notice other people's needs and help me to meet them when I can. I love you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Bye, Ridesville kids! Hello. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name's Doug Lane, and I'm glad to be with you today. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I just really appreciate you taking the time to worship with us today. And I hope that you will be um, inspired um, by uh, God's holy word, and uh, I pray that you will hear something in this message that might uh, touch you and reach you as well. Um, our Lesson comes from the book of Acts. We're looking at the book of Acts throughout this summer, and uh, we turn now to chapter 15 to the council at Jerusalem. And Luke tells us, Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it's necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as He did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, while you're putting God to the test by 
Excuse me. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we pray for your grace today. In the midst of our own frailties, flaws, and sins, and the judgments that should be reserved, um, that instead we tend to make toward others. Lord, give us grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if there's one thing that we can all agree on, it's that change is difficult. There are a lot of people I know who are more comfortable putting up with old problems than they are with finding new solutions. In fact, I'm probably one of them. They're like the church I recently heard about that desperately needed a new sanctuary, but they were afraid to take the risk of building it. During the worship service, you see, some plaster fell from the ceiling and hit the pastor on the head and sent him to the hospital. Well, immediately a meeting was called and the church leaders made the following decisions. One, we will build a new church. Two, we will build the new church on the same site as the old one. Three, we will use the materials of the old church to build the new one. And four, we will worship in the old church until the new one is built. It seems people are open to change as long as it doesn't inconvenience them, cost them anything, or change the way they do business or live their lives. But change is what brings us to the 15th chapter of Acts. Bishop William Cannon, in his commentary on the book of Acts, says, Next to the description of Pentecost in the second chapter of Acts, this passage is the most important in the entire book. For what takes place here opens up for the church its largest field for expansion and makes possible the eventual winning of the Roman Empire to Christianity. From this point on, Christianity is not just a part of a small Jewish sect, but it will become an independent movement growing into the New Testament church. The book of Acts, remember, is a birthday story. It's a story of the birth of the church. The church was literally born on fire. God sent the Holy Spirit to the very first believers as tongues of fire on that day of Pentecost. And 3,000 people converted to Christianity in one day, and the church was off to the races. Jesus had promised that when the Holy Spirit came on the believers, they would be His witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It was a breathtaking prediction and commandment. Jesus was asking His Jewish followers to take the gospel to people who had a different religion and to people who had no religion at all. It was to be for all cultures, all races, and all generations. The gospel was to be ubiquitous, taken everywhere, universally, and shared with everybody. Only the message of Christianity has that one word about God that everybody needs to hear. And of course, that is the word grace. Every other religion in the world is all about keeping rules and rituals. But Christianity is all about grace. Contrary to other religions, people were hearing for the very first time that salvation is not earned by being good or thinking good or doing good. It's not about keeping the right rules, the right rituals, or the right religion. Instead, salvation or eternal life is a gift of grace gained by faith. This message so empowered one man that he became, spiritually speaking, en fuego. He was formerly a Jewish hitman who had made it his life's goal to stamp out the church and kill the message of Jesus Christ. But he met Christ on the road to Damascus, was miraculously converted, and has now become the most famous, passionate flamethrower in the church. He just ended the first of three missionary journeys in which he traveled over 1,400 miles by boat, by donkey, by foot, going all over Asia Minor and for the first time, he'd taken the gospel not just to Jews, but to Gentiles, because Christianity was for everybody. This was not a Jerusalem thing or a Jewish thing. This was a God thing. 
Paul was in a city called Antioch, a Gentile city about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. He settled there with another teacher named Barnabas. Together they were offering God's gift of grace and these Gentiles were eagerly accepting it. Reports began to filter back into Jerusalem that all these Gentiles were becoming Christians, but they were not becoming Jewish first. Now, as a male, in order to become Jewish, you had to be circumcised. These Gentiles were all being baptized, but not circumcised. Can you guess what happened? Well, there arose in the church what we call a cold water committee. As you know, the greatest danger to fire is water. There were some people in the church that were ready to pour water on the fire that was spreading to the Gentiles. That was not that these Jewish believers didn't want Gentiles in the church. They did. But they wanted them in the church under their terms. So they started raising some big questions. Can you have conversion without circumcision? Can you have faith in Christ without obeying the law of Moses? Can you believe in the Messiah without first becoming a Jew? The church was about to answer one and for all the biggest question that deserved the biggest answer. How does a person enter into a permanent relationship with God? Who should be accepted in the church? Who gets in? What do you have to do to get in? What's required to become a member of God's family? The river of God's grace has now overflowed its Jewish banks. So what was the church going to do about it? Welcome to Acts 15. In the most important business meeting in the history of the church. The entire future of Christianity is at stake. What you're going to find in this chapter are fire extinguishers. You're going to see why churches fight, why churches die, why people don't go to church, why people who used to go to church quit going to church, and why a lot of people who keep going to church don't really enjoy doing so. Nothing will kill the heart, the spirit, the mission, the passion, or the effectiveness of the church greater than fire extinguishers. So here's a key takeaway for today. Make sure your Christian faith is fuel for the fire not water on the fire. The scripture tells us, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Do you hear the word custom? Put in there the word tradition. For thousands of years, every Jewish male had been circumcised. It's very plain that it was the sign of the covenant between God and the Jewish people. This is no small thing. It was the sacred tradition. Now you have uncircumcised Gentiles who are giving their lives to Christ, following Jesus in baptism, becoming members of the church without surgery, and these Jewish believers are saying, before you can be saved, you're going to have to have surgery first. Can you imagine what that did to the new members class? I can just imagine the husband taking his wife and kids to this new church and they're all wanting to join. But then he finds out what he's required to do. And well, you can't blame him for saying something like, honey, I don't mind if you and the kids go there, but I don't really think this is the church for me. Here in the 21st century, we're all sitting here going, this is unbelievable. You mean they didn't want to let people into the church just because they didn't look a certain way? A certain way that no one else would ever notice? That's exactly what these men were saying. Before you come into the church, you need to look like we think you ought to look. You need to do things the way we want them done. In other words, they were saying, you got to be just like us before you can become one of us. Now, before we take these men to task, let's be honest. We all need, excuse me, we all tend to settle into our particular version of what we think Christianity ought to be. We have a tendency to add one or two things. We either tend to add our own requirements of how to have a relationship with God or our own requirements of how to be right with God. 
in 99.99% of the time, it's because we're pushing our tradition over truth. I just think the pastor ought to always wear a suit and tie, right? Or how dare you have church that doesn't have communion every week? You mean you don't sing Amazing Grace every Sunday at exactly 11.25 a.m.? Understand there's nothing wrong with these traditions. Tradition can be a positive thing. Tradition can also be a neutral thing. And of course, tradition can be a negative thing. Here's how you know when tradition becomes a bad thing. When you put tradition over God's grace. When I was at Duke, I served a little church not too far away from the school. I was on a very steady decline. They had 157 members 20, 20 years before I arrived, but were down to 57 when I got there. I talked to the leaders about ways to bring in new members when one of the leaders spoke up and said, I don't want any new members. They don't think like we do. Oh, bless her heart. She was right that the new members might not think like her, but the church isn't a club, and God's grace is for everybody. So let's get back to the word. Being sent on their way by this church, Paul and Silas passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it's necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Paul and Barnabas, realizing this is a hill worth dying on, got involved into a very heated debate and discussion with these circumcisers. They decided to take the whole question to the spiritual leadership in Jerusalem where the apostles and elders are. I call it the Jerusalem showdown. On the one side, you've got legalism and rules, and on the other side, you've got grace and faith. One side is represented by the Pharisees, if you read much of the New Testament, you'll remember the Pharisees because everywhere Jesus went, the Pharisees went. The term Pharisee technically refers to a first century group of religious leaders that were very committed to a strict interpretation of the Mosaic law and they insisted on meticulous obser observation of that law. The term eventually became synonymous with legalism. Believe me when I tell you that legalism and Phariseeism is alive and well in every church today. If you don't know what a legalist is, let me just share with you a definition I read that's both humorous and true. Legalists love to act like God by making rules. Legalists love rules about the rules. Legalists love rules about who gets to make the rules about the rules. Legalists love rules about who gets to enforce the rules made by the people whom the rules appointed to make the rules about the rules. Legalists really love rules about who gets to interpret the rules that rule. And legalists get perfectly euphoric when they get to enact the rules by punishing people who break the rules as interpreted by those who are appointed by the rules. In the end, legalists want to rule through rules and weld their rules like weapons to divide the church into its many parts. Honestly, that's exactly what kept me from accepting God's call to be a pastor back when I was in high school. I didn't think I was good enough. I was constantly trying to shape up, to do better, to try harder. How miserable I was. What a nervous Christian I became. I figured that God had a record book that he kept in heaven. On the page with my name at the top, he'd drawn a line down the center with debits and credits on either side of the line. On a good day, I might tally enough plus points to be pleasing and acceptable to God. Well, on a bad day, I'd be afraid to go to sleep at night, lest I'd not earn the right to heaven if I should die before I wake. Kind of like on the show The Good Place, if you've ever seen that. It was the greatest freedom in the world to be delivered from that kind of works righteousness. When I realized that I was never going to be good enough, but instead was forgiven and empowered to live a life that wasn't perfect, but rather going on toward perfection, I felt a marvelous deliverance. Forgiveness cannot be earned nor merited. It's already been given. 
It just needs to be accepted by faith. This is the problem facing the early church. These Pharisees were saying, if you want to be a Christian, you not only have to be circumcised, but you've got to keep all these laws and all these rules, and you've got to obey the law of Moses. Today we've substituted bylaws for the law of Moses. We've substituted our made-up laws for the law of Moses. We've got people today, if they could, they'd make it illegal to go into church wearing shorts and flip-flops. They'd make it illegal to drink a cup of coffee in the sanctuary. They'd make it illegal to sing anything except hymns, and they'd make it illegal not to do it out of the hymn book. They really don't care about relationships. They just care about the rules. They really don't care whether people come to church or not, as long as they come dressed the way they think they ought to be dressed, looking the way they think they ought to look, acting the way they think they ought to act, and doing what they think they ought to do. When you push tradition over truth and grace, you become a fire extinguisher. When you push rules over relationships, you also become a fire extinguisher. Paul and Barnabas have shared the incredible things that God has been doing with the Gentiles as they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were the new kids on the block. But there were two people that the early church needed to hear from. When I was a kid, there was a commercial from a financial advisor called E.F. Hutton that went like this. When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. It was time for the E.F. Huttons of the early church to speak up. And their names were Peter and James. First, Peter speaks up. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Peter understood that these Pharisees were correct in their observations. They just weren't correct in their conclusions. These Pharisees were saying, just look at these Gentiles. They don't always wash their hands before they eat, which the law says you should. When they do wash their hands, they don't eat right. They eat shrimp on the barbie. They put sausage on their pizza. They even go to the synagogue wearing t-shirts and jeans, and some of them have on flip-flops. They may be clean, but they're not conformed to what we want and to what we think. And up to that point, the Pharisees were right. But Peter points out a fatal flaw. You're focused on the external, not the internal. Listen to these verses again. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Did you hear that phrase, God who knows the heart? In the Greek language, there's a noun, cardionostis. Cardio means heart and gnostis means knowledge. It literally means a heart knower. God is the divine cardiologist. The difference is a human cardiologist knows about the heart. God knows the heart. Literally, this is what happens with legalists and Pharisees. They miss the heart of the matter of Christianity because Christianity is a matter of the heart. The reason why you have fire extinguishers in the church is because they don't see people the way God sees them. 1 Samuel 16 says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Whenever anyone walks into a church, the only thing that matters to God is not the color of their skin or the kind of clothes that they wear, but the condition of their heart. And then Peter slams the point home with the force of a sledgehammer. He says, now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of Jesus, just as they will. When Peter made this statement, mouths flew open and eyes fell out of their sockets. Because here is Peter the number one Jew, and everyone's expecting him to say something like, 
Well, we believe these Gentiles can be saved by grace through faith, just like us. But instead, he turns it around and says, we believe that even we Jews can be saved by grace, just like these Gentiles. In other words, in order to be saved, they don't have to become like us. We have to become like them. What matters is God's grace, not tradition. What matters is a relationship, not rules. And what matters is the internal, not the external. Peter knew if you subtract from grace, it's no longer grace. And if you add to grace, it's no longer grace. Our job is not to subtract or add to grace. Our job is to divide grace and multiply it so that everyone can receive it. My prayer is that our church will be known throughout the Wilmington area as the place where everybody finds God's grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, your grace flows everywhere. It's messy. It goes on to people that we might not think deserve it. <laughs> it even lands on us. Lord, continue to pour grace and help us not only to receive it, but to begin to understand it and to share it with others. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. Amen. Thanks be to God, grace is for everybody. God loves us all. And we, are, we want to put God in a box and say we only, only God will accept people if they do this or if they'll do that, but God loves everybody. God sent Jesus, His Son, to the cross for all of our sins. None are too big. Nope. God loves you. And so I would invite you, as uh, you go through this week, to receive that grace of God and also to give grace to the people around you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.